All right. Well, I, I'm Andrew Gordon, a professor of history at Harvard and in the East Asian Languages and Civilizations Department also. And it's my great pleasure this morning or evening, depending on where you are, our speaker for our speaker, it's late in the evening, to welcome you all to today's session of the program on US-Japan relations fall seminar series. One of the benefits, if that's an okay word to use, of doing all of our activities remotely is it's much easier than ordinarily to invite speakers to join us from afar. And that's the case today. And of course, that's the reason also that we're not meeting at our ordinary noontime hour. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Naoko Shimazu, currently at the National University Singapore's uh, Department of History within the, or within the Yale NUS College of the National University of Singapore and the Department of History there. Professor Shimazu's work is, I think, well known to many of you. It's certainly well known to me. She's a distinguished scholar with a career of important publications. She came to Singapore by way of Canada, her BA in Manitoba in political science, and then Oxford with a degree in international relations. And after that, a uh, stint teaching in London at the University of London, Burbeck uh, in the Department of History. And she's written several important books. The first one, Race, Japan, Race and, in, and Equality, not Inequality, Japan, Race and Equality, looking at the racial equality proposal at the end of the First World War in 1919. And a second book that was particular of particular interest to me because I'd also studied the domestic aftermath of the Russo-Japanese War, uh, published in 2009, Japanese Society at War, Death Memory and the Russo-Japanese War from Cambridge University Press. She's also edited a book on nationalisms in Japan and another work on imagining Japan in post-war East Asia. Her talk today, which looks at both the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere and the uh, major conference that took place in Tokyo in 1943 and the Bandung Conference in Indonesia in 1955 is one I'm really looking forward to. I'm familiar with a bit of Professor Shimazu's work to date on this project, especially two really fine papers she wrote on the Bandung Conference of 1955, looking at the theatrics of that conference. And it won't be a focus of her talk today, but I particularly recommend to you uh, the article she published on um, gender in that conference, which is a remarkable example of reading the evidence against the grain, if you will, especially looking at the photographic record of that conference to talk about the role played by the women, basically the wives of the diplomats of the heads of state um, who were convening and attending the conference. So it's really a great pleasure to welcome Professor Shimazu here today. I'm very much looking forward to her talk. And after that, of course, there'll be a chance for all of you to ask questions. So with that, before I turn it over to Professor Shimazu, just a couple of um, uh, announcements or messages. First, we have one other event this week. This will be an evening event here in uh, Cambridge on Wednesday evening, 8 to 9 p.m. Paul Bluestein speaking on uh, Schism II, China and America's trade conflict in the upcoming Biden administration. So please join us on that occasion as well. Finally, a bit of etiquette and housekeeping. I believe most of you are familiar with this by now, but still, please let me just run through the uh, rules. Please keep your microphone muted unless you're speaking. The chat function will be closed during the talk and then open right at the end. And at that point, please write your question in chat at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I'll call on as many as possible during the roughly 25 to 30 minutes that we'll have. Uh, during the Q&A, um, you, if you want to raise your hand, in addition to using the chat, you can use the blue raise hand um, button in the participation uh, icon at the bottom of your screen. I should say that the, this session is being recorded by staff. Only those whose microphones are active will have their image recording recorded. So if you're not speaking, you will not be recorded. And finally, please do not 
take screenshots and such. Respect the privacy of those in the gallery view on your screens. All right, with that, Professor Shimasu, welcome. Right. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Right. Yes. Well, thank you very much, um, Professor Gordon, for the very kind introduction. And also to uh, Professor Fujihira um, and the um, Raisho Institute of um, Harvard, um, and particularly the US um, Japan program for hosting me and all the other co sponsoring uh, institutions at Harvard uh, for this talk. And um, it gives me a sort of particular pleasure to be talking today. As we all know, it's a significant day. <laughs> and um, the 79th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And it may be quite an uh, opportune thing for me to be talking partly about the 1943 conference um, um, as a result of that. And thank you very much for um, making the time um, earlier, probably than your usual seminar time. Um, as you can see from my um, background here, this is uh, my college, here yeah, NUS College, <laughs> and it is 10 p.m. here. Um, so I hope the discussions and all that will keep me alive and all lively for the next um, an hour and a half or so. Right, so as some of you may know, um, I have been working for much of the last decade um, on the um, cultural history or what I call cultural history of diplomacy. And essentially it's the application of um, cultural approaches to the study of diplomacy, especially in thinking about the methodological. And so I became interested in how cultural history um, can shed light on symbolic meanings embedded in the practice of diplomacy. So my theoretical inspirations come from, you know, well-known sources that you, I'm sure you, you have all come across, like Clifford Goetz's, um, you know, the theater state, um, Irving Goffman, um, you know, front stage, backstage kind of idea, as well as Jeffrey Alexander's um, cultural sociology has been quite an important influence um, on, on my thinking. Um, and then in particular, I became interested in using this um, theater analogy. And I use this term uh, diplomacy as theater um, to explain this. And what I do is I, I, it's, it's a very good way of um, breaking down uh, the, the kind of event into its component parts. So you have the theater, uh, yeah, sorry, you have the stage, you have the audience, you have the actors, and then you have the script. Um, and this enables me to reconstruct quite carefully in a three-dimensional manner, how a particular event um, took place. And the reason why I like doing this uh, is it enables me to examine uh, more critically these individual components and the interrelationship between them um, with an eye for detail. And because it's actually in the minutiae uh, which we find rich material revealing the underlying um, you know, political cultural assumptions that we find the, that are being made in organizing such uh, diplomatic events. And moreover, as Professor Gordon has kindly uh, mentioned, I've come to realize that visual sources um, provide a significant insight into the symbolic dimensions of diplomacy. So in this presentation, um, I like to think about how Asia, Asia in this quotation marks, was constructed as imagined geographies, um, or more to the point, perhaps symbolic geographies, uh, through a comparative study of the 1943 Great East Asia Conference and the 1955 um, Asian African Conference, but commonly known as the Bandung Conference. So not only do I want to suggest that there were competing imagined geographies of Asia, Asia in this sense, presented through these cases, but more importantly, that these imagined geographies were made manifest uh, phenomenologically um, as choreo choreographed and enacted symbolic performances at Tokyo and Bandung. So I'm going to try to explain what I mean by all these things. So let's begin with the 1943 conference. Um, I'm sure some of you are um, you know, quite versed in this and others may not be. So I'm just going to assume in this talk that um, 
I'm talking, <laughs> I'm not going to assume much knowledge. Uh, uh, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating the obvious. Um, so this was held on the 5th and the 6th of November, 1943, um, obviously convened, convened by the then Prime Minister, General Tojo. And uh, he gathered the five independent states um, of Manchukuo, the national government of China, the Nanjing regime, the Philippines, Burma, and Thailand, in order to show a united front against the Allied powers, and most importantly, to confirm the establishment of this, um, you know, this uh, idea of the co uh, Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. And it was the only large-scale diplomatic pageantry held in wartime Japan that attempted to make some diplomatic capital out of this conception of the Greater East Asia a cold prosperity sphere. So not only by coincidence, uh, not was it by coincidence that it was held when military fortunes uh, of the Japanese began to suffer some serious setbacks. Now, generally speaking, um, the Tokyo conference has not been given enough scholarly attention over the years, um, mainly because the event comes, comes across as being Japan's ill-fated and grandiose charade uh, without much substance or credibility to speak of. And only the apologists would argue that the 1943 conference represented a significant step in the liberation of Asia and independence. But of course, in the last five years, we've had a sea change in that uh, we had uh, two, um, uh, two works that came out. Uh, one was the 2015 work by Jasmine Nabel, and the other one uh, is the most recent one in 2019 of Jeremy Yellen. And Jeremy's book uh, is actually on the great uh, on the Greater East Asia Cold Prosperity Sphere itself. Um, and Jasmine's work is a much longer jury um, work in which she has a chapter on this conference as well. Um, so what I think their main um, uh, focus or, or uh, contribution is, is to state that there, there was this um, continuation or continuity of internationalist thinking, um, even in the drafting of the Great East Asia uh, Declaration, um, because as, as Japan's military fortunes declined, um, Japan perceived that uh, there was a greater need to appeal to the um, countries of the cold prosperity sphere um, by incorporating a more internationalist rhetoric. Now, as somebody who is interested in symbolic diplomacy, I'm going to demonstrate um, how symbolic meanings have been uh, embedded almost as a codified language um, in the way the conference was staged. In scrutinizing the details of the conference preparation and hosting, insofar as Tojo as the chief host was concerned, the purpose of the conference seemed to be primarily symbolic in any case, to convey what the cold prosperity sphere was meant to symbolize as a geographical imaginary. Now, we will discover that Tojo was both the choreographer and the actor um, of this show, and that became emblematic of his notion of the um, cold prosperity, uh, Great East Asia. So indeed, the multiple role playing by Tojo and the importance he attached to it becomes pivotal to our understanding of this particular story. So firstly, um, I'm going to do share screen. Um, so just bear with me. Okay, so I'm sure you all seen this photograph. Um, and uh, so the conference had the effect of enacting and here, I really mean acting out physically uh, Japan's vision of Asia into a three-dimensional political reality. So all delegates were aware of the consequences of their attendance because the very fact of their bodily presence gave credence to the whole event. This is because the very enactment of an event has the symbolic effect of legitimizing it. In its most fundamental sense, therefore, the significance of this Great East Asia Conference lies in the very fact of it having taken place. Now, the six independent states, 
um, of um, the coast prosperity sphere. As you, as you see there, you have Bamao representing Burma, you know, Wang Jingwei, uh, reorganized nationalist regime of um, Republic of China, Prince Wan, represent Thailand, Loro, the Philippines, Zhang Jinghui, Manchukuo, and Spas Chandrapos on the right. Now, so these six states were personified by these leaders. Um, and so in other words, the conference allowed the world to visualize what each independent state looked like in the bodily presence of its leader. And as such, it represented the most up-to-date visualization of what Asia with Japan's sponsored independent states looked like to contemporaries worldwide. And in so doing, the participating great, great East Asian states could also see themselves playing part in um, an alternative wartime geography drawn by the Japanese. So this was the principal objective in some sense um, uh, of the Japanese in convening the conference that they wanted to confirm and legitimize the existence of this cold prosperity sphere um, by gathering these people, leaders in Tokyo. Now, um, as Stockholm's um, Doug Poston uh, reported, the Tokyo conference was credited with the same level of importance as the Axis anti-Axis powers meeting in Moscow. And here I quote, Japan was arranging a big demonstration of Great East Asia under Japanese leadership that would be unbreakable federation of states in years to come. How wrong they proved to be. Um, therefore, the conference was an enactment of the notional framework of the cold prosperity sphere as this three-dimensional political reality through the bodily representations of these states as statesmen. And so these statesmen were actually actors in this um, uh, um, vision of Asia presented. And for the first time, uh, if I'm wrong, please tell me, um, the world witnessed Asia as an alliance of independent states. Now, um, let's move to the more detailed choreography of the conference by Tojo and the symbolic meaning behind it. So um, Tojo makes a statement at a cabinet meeting on the 23rd of July, 1943. And he says, states of Great East Asia, not foreign countries, but even towards weaker and smaller states, we must adopt the form of equal treatment. Greater East Asia ministry also is constructed on the notion that they, these states, are not foreign states. What Tojo advocated was to have the informality of familial relations amongst the states within the uh, co-prosperity sphere, whilst at the same time having the semblance of the relationship of equality of states that existed between sovereign states. Now, Tojo attempts to perform these two seemingly conflicting qualities of the interstate relationships within the co-prosperity sphere through the staging of the conference and through his own personal performance in the role as a host. So how did Tojo attempt to show equality of states? On the whole, Tojo preferred, preferred to enact the relationship of equality through very symbolic details. Um, the key is Tojo's personal emphasis made on the importance of the form of equality. Um, one of the most visible forms in which this equality took place was, in, was the Japanese decision to place the invited states in the order of the Japanese alphabet, the Iroha. Now I'm going to um, show some slides here. Now, uh, for those of you who uh, read Japanese, you know that this is this Iroha ni Hoheto. Now, if you look at the red um, um, here, letters ni, chi, ta, ma, hu, hi. And these represent ni as Nippon, chi is China, Chugoku, ta is Thailand, uh, ma is Manchukuo, hu is the Philippines, and he is the Burma, is Burma actually. And um, this is this was essential for, for the Japanese because um, they wanted to put Japan first before any other countries. And so using this iroha was an ingenious device 
um, uh, whoever thought of it must have got some medal or got promoted two or three ranks up uh, because it naturally enabled Japanese to take the position of leadership by being the first amongst equals. And another very interesting thing is that um, they didn't really care which order um, the other states followed after Japan. So as long as Japan was first, Nippon, then the other states, they could you explain this away by saying that, um, you know, it was the randomness of the order, i.e. why did China come before Thailand? Why did Thailand before uh, come, come before Thailand? Um, Thailand did come before Manchuria. Um, it was in some sense immaterial because it was intentional to avoid the semblance of giving preferential treatment to some states of others. So this Iroha order was used everywhere in when these represent delegations were presented to the emperor in the seating of the, um, this is um, another photo that you may be familiar with. So this is the main conference hall. Um, so you see Tojo here. And then again, you follow the same order. So you have uh, China, Thailand, Manchukuo, Philippines, Burma, and Indy here is sitting because the, he, he, towards the end of the conference, is given uh, the mandate over the Andaman and Nicobar Islands by Tojo. So at this moment, he's still there as an observer because he's not independent yet, you see, Azad Hind. Um, and another important thing to note about this whole Iroha business, and then you see it in another version here, um, now, this is Tojo going around at the end of the conference, essentially shaking everybody's hands. And now you see that they, uh, Azad Hind is standing because he had just made a declaration that they were going to be receiving the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So if you go back to the previous photograph, you will see that Tojo here essentially asked the independent states to stand up to show that they were independent um, sort of, uh, you know, configuration of states within Japan's or, uh, sense of the um, Asian um, order that's been uh, forwarded uh, in this conference. Now, um, I think I was running out of time because I'm taking so long to explain this thing. Um, let's see. And then the, you can see lots of things like this in other, other details of the conference. And for example, in the, um, the accommodation of the conference, for example, was very, very important. And Tojo uh, paid a huge amount of effort in making sure absolutely that everything was right. And he inspected all the residences which had been given to the, key, uh, to the leaders in the Western part of Tokyo and with the Imperial Hotel's general manager in tow. And he clearly considered the Imperial Hotel to be not up to par for these important visitors. And he went around essentially asking all these visitors, uh, all these delegates, um, leaders, whether they were comfortable in their accommodation. And he would say things like, um, a few days ago, I made an inspection of your accommodation, but if there's anything that's wanting, please do not hesitate to let me know. Or for example, it is cold in Japan. So please take good care of your health and do not catch cold. So you might think it's a bit creepy being uh, <laughs> given this much attention by Tojo. But the point is that for him, this sort of seemingly excessive um, demonstration of care and concern for the well-being of, of his visitors was a way of demonstrating his brotherly love to them. Um, and so he thought that this was very important, this kind of personal concern shown to the visitors uh, in, convey, in conveying both the familial relationship and the relationship of equality at the same time. Now, um, as I think, um, how, how, am I sort of halfway through the time? I'm not, because we started a few minutes late, so I just kind of, okay, well, anyway, let me just, um, go. Uh, so now we move to the Bandung conference, so let, which is a, an entirely different uh, conference altogether. And as a contrast, in large part, Bandung was about a demonstrable chronological break with the colonial past. 
um, with the establishment of a new post-colonial independent states from the ashes of the fallen and waning empires. Um, nevertheless, Bandung was also about continuity uh, of some states and their leaders surviving the ravages of the Second World War to live and to tell the tale. Now, notably, Shigemi Tsumamoru uh, was, the, was the foreign minister both times in 1943 and 1955 at the time of the Bandung Conference. Um, and then again, Prince Wan, Wan Taekon of Thailand, he was also in, um, <laughs> in Tokyo in 1943 and then Bandung in 1955. But most incredibly, Shigemitsu and Prince Wan were both at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. And so for me, that's a terribly interesting thing that it is really these people's lifetime that these um, significant moments of history are happening. Now, um, uh, the and of course, Shigemitsu was part of this uh, disillusioned group of younger diplomats in 1919 um, and you know, started up this um, almost like a young Turks group within the foreign ministry, the Kachin group. Now, um, Sukarno, who was peeved um, at not being invited to uh, the Tokyo conference in 1943, is now the host of the country uh, that's, the, uh, that's um, hosting this uh, major conference. And um, I'm not going to be talking about Japan in this one, but all I wanted to say was that Jap the Japanese attendance proved to be rather an uneasy one uh, for many reasons that you can probably imagine. Um, and, but one of the fundamental problems that the Japanese had, um, in my view, was that they simply could not share and did not share the shared experiences of the suffering and, you know, uh, and, and the struggle for decolonization that uh, bound uh, most of the other states together at Bandung in 1955. Now, this conference took place over one week in April. Um, in Bandung, in, which, is, uh, which was a significant city within the Dutch East Indies um, and later in Indonesia, but perhaps not a city that otherwise uh, would have been known. But this conference put Bandung very much on the map. And, um, and then the personalities at this conference mattered greatly. And you have some of the, these are the kind of um, photographs that you would see in press coverages of the Bandung conference. So you have NASA here, you got Nehru, you got UNU, and they're always congregating. They're always kind of speaking, laughing with each other, having a you know, joke or a chat. And that kind of imagery of the conference was disseminated very widely through you know, Reuters, Associated Press, and all that. So you often found the same image that might have been featured in the times of Rangoon, for example, in the Egyptian Gazette, and then also in, in another one of the Indonesian uh, local newspapers, for instance. So there was some, there was this very interesting kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of globality about the dissemination of images and the fact that a lot of the uh, readers of these um, news actually did see the same image often throughout in many different parts of the world. Um, in Bandung, um, so you see already that there is a sizable shift in the center uh, of aging geopolitics at Bandung compared to obviously from the 1943. And now Southeast Asia and South Asia uh, taking center stage in this newly redrawn symbol symbolic geography of Asia. And Africa was clearly secondary in this, in this whole kind of thing. But um, in spite of that, there were the six African, so African states that participated in the conference um, punched above their weight. NASA's charismatic uh, neutralist diplomacy, for example, ensured that he always had a uh, sort of center stage together with Nehru, together with Joe or some other people. And also uh, Liberia and the Gold Coast, um, they dominated visually uh, uh, as the most photographed delegations throughout the entire conference for one week simply by wearing this striking national dress everywhere. So in, in that sense, it was a very highly effective nonverbal performance of sartorial diplomacy. 
Now, um, so Bandung, uh, the city was, um, uh, there was a special conference zone created within the city. And so this spatial demarcation allowed uh, Sukarno, the president, to create sort of his idea of a post-colonial Asia Africa in Bandung itself. And so uh, 10 days before the conference was to begin, he came to Bandung and inspected all the, all the conference sites and renamed the main venues and the street, including the street. So the conference thoroughfare was now renamed as Asia Africa Road. The conference venue, which was used to be called Dutch uh, Concordia so, uh, Society Club, is, was now renamed as Gudum Mudeka, which means freedom building. And then the secondary venue was renamed as second, uh, Duiwana uh, building. Duiwana means two colors of the Indonesian flag of red and white. Um, so the, all these kind of symbolisms, um, uh, essentially Sukarno was able to create just by you know, coming and telling them that that's what he wanted um, 10 days before the conference. He actually even wanted to create an um, Asia Africa restaurant but was vetoed due to shortage of time and budget. But he managed to include local cuisine as diplomatic cuisine in, in the banquets um, during the conference. Shimano so Sensei, you, um, I, sorry, sorry, we have a short time. Can you talk about five more minutes and then we'll okay. open yeah. it to Q&A? Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so Bandung was in some sense very much about motion. Um, and maybe all this I can I can talk about it more uh, in the discussion time. Uh, so this is the freedom building to which all the delegates on the um, this is Ban uh, Sukarno inspecting the conference site, um, and this is the first day of the opening when the delegates are walking down fifty meters or hundred meters towards the freedom building that you saw, and this kind of walk, which was sort of like a spontaneous. Uh, kind of uh, procession to the, into this iconic site of, um, uh, of, this, um, of this conference. And I've kind of, I, re I named it uh, as the Freedom Walk uh, because it was sort of a walk which kind of symbolized the attainment of freedom by reaching the building, which was called the Freedom Building. And it was quite sort of poignant because some countries, uh, some some of the delegations like the Gold Coast were still not, uh, was still not independent. It became independent in 1953, uh, 57, but it was invited by the um, co-hosts, uh, by the conference hosts in order to kind of have presence uh, at Bandung. So it was all about this kind of independence or post-coloniality in the making. And um, this is the process in which the states were going to, um, um, follow in order to become independent. Now, I'm just going to um, say, uh, because I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite calculate this enough um, in terms of the timing of all this, um, that for me, uh, this kind of using this symbolic kind of um, way of understanding how diplomacy worked as, as sort of like, you know, performances enables me to understand uh, emotions, the role of emotions in, uh, in diplomacy. And the photos that you saw of the Tokyo conference and the photos that you see of the Bandung conference, um, they, they managed to convey the sense of the, the strength of emotions, even in the Tokyo one, the fact that they, they actually looked incredibly kind of, the emotions are suppressed and that to me is a very emotional, highly charged state, as well as kind of exuberance that you see in Bandung. So in some sense, Bandung and um, Tokyo were polar opposites in terms of how emotions were used in, in, the, um, in displaying um, the, you know, the state of uh, things in, in, in diplomacy. And the interesting thing about it, and I'm going to end on this one, which is that this walk, the Freedom Walk, um, got um, sort of adopted by the um, Indonesian government uh, in the last uh, 15 years. And on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the conference, um, and as well as a 50th anniversary in 2005, actually started then, uh, they decided to invite all these countries in the global south and do this walk. And they call it the historic walk. 
and they do it. Um, they did it again in 2000, um, or this is 2015. 100, uh, 106 states were invited uh, from the global South countries. Um, and in 2005, there were much less, but still more than 29 that were originally there in Bandung. So this has become a really important kind of symbolic um, register for the global South in terms of um, you know, sharing the common kind of identity, solidarity, uh, even in today's um, diplomacy. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much for a really um, rich presentation. And um, I learned a lot, um, uh, especially I hadn't really seen that analysis of the visual record of the Greater East Asia Conference. And, and I much enjoyed it. The chat function is open. So those of you who have questions, please post them. Uh, but let me start off while you're doing that with one question that occurred to me. You mentioned the dis wide dissemination of the records of or, or the images of the Bandung conference globally. And it's easy to understand that how, how that would happen. But I'm curious about what you know about the uses to which the visual Im images of the um, 1943 conference were were put uh, or what kind of use did the participating not so much in Japan but do, have you looked into the extent to which the other um, heads of state and their governments were anxious to promote the images of that conference um, for the sake of their legitimacy hmm. um, so I'm afraid Andy I haven't um, I haven't looked into I haven't done a tour of the uh, newspapers. Uh, of the um, Great East Asia Conference, like I have done for the Bandung. So I can't definitively say, um, you know, but I would imagine that in the Japan controlled presses uh, in the Greater East Asia zone, uh, there would, there, you know, I wouldn't be at all surprised that uh, the that, that Imperial Diet Building photograph, for example, uh, might have been the, one of the main images to be disseminated. Um, Great. Well, thank you. Well, there's a, there's a whole bunch of um, questions coming in. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll just quickly summarize them and present rather than we've got about 20 minutes or so rather than calling on the participants. But David Howell has a question about, um, well, besides a comment on the lack of golf carts during the Freedom Walk, wondering about languages used in the two conferences and whether there was controversy around the use of language um, and what kind of attention was given to that. Okay, shall I answer? Yes. Yeah, okay, so um, in the Tokyo conference, it was quite complicated because um, uh, Japanese uh, was used, but the countries also gave speeches in some of them in their own languages, like Thailand, I think, gave speech in Thai, um, one Thai form. And, but um, um, other countries submitted, they were asked to submit their speeches to the Japanese beforehand. And um, uh, Loro, for example, of the Philippines, he absolutely denied, rejected this thing, saying that the Japanese were uh, meddling into uh, Filipino affairs. And also he asked for an interpreter because there was an interpreter at the conference, but the co conference interpreter uh, was a foreign ministry interpreter. And Laurel said he wanted to have a, another interpreter. Um, I think somebody called Hamamatsu, I think, who was a very trusted um, uh, official. Um, and uh, because he said that he couldn't, he couldn't trust the Japanese to uh, interpret. Uh, uh, word for word, what he had written. Now, the, in Bandung, the language was actually English, uh, but there was some simultaneous uh, translations provided in French. Um, and also the delegates could bring their own translators uh, to the conference. Um, so for example, John Lai, who could speak English, he only spoke in Chinese and um, he so you will always, almost always see photographs of Joe with his uh, interpreter uh, in tow. They were inseparable, um, and 
and so on. And some other, you know, uh, leaders spoke in French and which was translated uh, into English through this kind of simultaneous translation. Yes, thank you. That's interesting. There's a question. So language would be one way to um, present and imagine geography. I suppose another would, besides photographs, would be maps. And Alan Henriksen asks about the cartographic representation of the imagined geographies of the two mm -hmm. meetings. What can you say about whether it's the the conveners of the two meetings or the other participants uh, as to how maps were deployed to present the imagined geographies of these two eras? Or... Yeah, so um, if I could, I'm just going to show um, share screen again, because I think I do have a um, um, sorry, map. Oh, I see, sorry. In this version, it doesn't. Um, I, I did have a map um, of the Great East, uh, of the Andun Conference. And what they did was they, they, in fact, you do see maps in lots of different uh, representations of Andun. Um, for example, the conference bulletin, which was published by the um, Office of Information of the Indonesian government, they had a daily conference bulletin and they would have maps on there. Um, and for, there, there were big maps uh, printed out for billboards throughout the city. And you actually see this kind of, I think there was this fascination about how big um, a space uh, that, you know, how big a space this kind of, congr you know, this amalgamation of 29 states uh, represented uh, geographically or carto cartographically. Um, so you have this kind of uh, person kind of busily putting up on the billboard, the big map of Asia, Africa. Um, you also have this map. Uh, of um, Asia Africa in this very famous article in the Life magazine. Uh, in, um, yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to have to be, mute my mic for, yeah. for, for, for a second. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I would say that for Bandu, you do see a lot of uh, representations uh, through maps. Um, in, the, um, in the Great East Asia, I actually, in the main ones, you actually don't see maps um, as much. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, the, the, there must be reasons for this, but it's not something that's, um, uh, that's, that comes across as being uh, a significant aspect of uh, the kind of, you know, pictorial or cartographical um, representation in 1943. Right. And so, you're muted. <clears throat> Andy, I was going to say you were muted when you were speaking. Sorry about that. I had the chat function fully occupying my screen. So I, there are a couple questions focused on Japan's role. And I thought uh, it, it would be good to take a bit of time to uh, raise those. Irv Plotkin asks for more on the reception of Japan at the Bandung conference. And then one of the grad students here, Boha Wu, asks about similarity in Japan's self perceptions as presented in the two events. And um, in particular, um, the, the Japanese observer Takasaki proposes um, a role for Japan to share industrial technology. Oh, he wonders if that has some echo of this first among equals notion in the cold prosperity sphere. Mm. Okay, so I think going to uh, going back to the first question about the reception of Japan at the Bandun conference. Um, so there was obviously a discussion about who to invite and who not to invite. Um, and you may have, I don't know if you know this, but uh, the two Koreas were not invited. Israel wasn't invited um, and so on. Um, and Japan, when it came to the question of Japan, there was not much of a 
discussion. They basically, the country said, yeah, okay, we're going to invite Japan, uh, mainly because we want to show the magnanimity and of, of the kind of Asian states um, in, you know, in having just experienced kind of the horrors of Japanese occupation. They, they wanted to look ahead look into the future. And so Japan was a very, considered to be a very important part of the rebuilding of Asia. Um, but um, the Japanese simply did not get much press. And um, if you look at the American State, uh, document, State Department documents, they were very disappointed in the Japanese performance in the kind of more usual foreign policy performance. Uh, um, way, uh, because the Japanese simply uh, did not, you know, they were, they really didn't say very much, didn't do very much, and in so, so much so that it kind of reminded me a bit of um, the Paris Peace Conference, actually, in the way the Japanese were described. Um, they're sort of like, sphinx, they're not quite sphinx-like, as they were described in 1919. But um, I think in 1919, the Japanese did more diplomacy, more kind of going around, you know, nemashi and that sort of thing, particularly over the racial equality uh, negotiations. Uh, of course, we know that it failed, but there was a lot of behind the scenes diplomacy going on. And I'm not actually, um, I don't think there was uh, anywhere near that, that kind of um, diplomatic effort going on in, uh, in, in, in the Bamboo Conference. Okay, so let me go to the, um, the uh, is it Bohao? Wu Bohao? Yes. yes. Um, yeah, so I actually, um, I don't really see, I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> you know, this Japan self-perception in 1943 and 1955. I've been quite troubled by this uh, connection between 1943 and 1955, mainly because, you know, I started from the 1955 angle, the Bandung conference. And if you do Bandung uh, and you, you're within the literature, uh, it's really very strongly about the break from the past. Um, so I, I think it, it may be quite controversial to say that there was connections between 1943 and 1955, um, but, the point is, I thought that by bringing out this kind of notions of imagined geographies, then there was clearly some kind of correlation or lack of correlation, as the case may be. Um, it, it, we could compare Asia, you know, in 43 and Asia in 1955. Um, the self-perception itself, um, I'm not I'm not entirely sure because the self-perception of the Japanese in 1955, um, I know that, you know, there's obviously things written about it, um, but I, I'm fundamentally uh, of the view that it simply did not have a strong sense of how it could present itself to uh, Asian African newly post-colonial states. And um, and I think uh, Kweku Ampia, who's, you know, who's written about Japan and Bandung, uh, Japan, uh, British Americans and the Japanese at Bandung and the, and the kind of foreign policy kind of type of um, uh, more diplomatic history uh, type of research. And Kweku is very interesting because he's actually, he went on to work on the, um, uh, on the, on Japan's aid to um, Southeast Asia in the post-war period. And he said that there was really a very interesting parallel to what Japan was trying to do uh, in the Greater East Asia uh, period, um, less successfully than they, were, they had managed to do in the post-war period. Um, so, you know, perhaps there is this, this and he, he's the one who kind of talks about the interest and the importance of the economic perspective in understanding the Japanese um, sort of thinking on all this. And I think that might be a very interesting kind of way to go into the Japanese uh, self-perception um, in, in the post-war period, if, if you want to use Bandung as a way of looking into this. Thank you. That's that's really interesting. There's one one other question that uh, is brings out c connections between the two was posed is posed by Christina Davis, um, and she notes 
something that hadn't occurred to me that the two national well, well, if you think about the two national, or I'm sorry, international organizations, the League of Nations and the United Nations, mm -hmm. the League um, in 1932 does not recognize Manchukuo. The UN in the 1950s is not recognizing the PRC. Yet Bandung invites the uh, Japan, of course, invites Manchukuo in 1943. The Bandung leaders invite the PRC and not Taiwan. So in both cases, the imagined geography of the conference goes against the international organization's view of um, a geo you know, global sovereignty and geography. Um, mm -hmm. So th that raises the question of how this state, such as the United States, well, let's, I, perhaps especially in the case of Bandung, um, react to this, uh, this disjunction between the mm -hmm the you know the reigning international body and the conferences mm. okay so i think one of the best ways of understanding bandung apart from obviously the decolonization narrative is actually to situate it within the um the narrative of of uh, uh international multilateral diplomacy so the united nations general assembly uh, was sort of like the model that the Bandung nations aspired to. And particularly, I've looked, obviously, during the negotiation uh, discussions in the conference, and one of the really interesting things was that even the countries which were still not members, not being admitted to the United Nations, they were willing to accept the United Nations Charter as the basis of conducting this conference. So their vision was actually very much to do with this new multilateral diplomacy of the post-war period. And also bearing in mind uh, that there was quite a lot of diplomacy going on between the Af African and Asian states in New York around the United Nations and Washington. So there were these diplomatic circles and they helped each other, they spoke to each other and so in, in other words, many of these people had already met through the United Nations circle. Um, and so when they come to Bandung, uh, they, so for example, Carlos Romulo. So this is where it's really interesting how the, the Cold War diplomacy of the East and the West and the United States and, you know, Soviet Union, that sort of thing, um, simply uh, gets kind of left behind because there are already networks existing amongst Asian African states uh, in many different ways, but most notably and most immediately before 1955 conference in the form of the um, United Nations diplomacy. And that's a very significant thing that all of them recognize. And for example, Carlos Romulo, who was the Filipino uh, lead, uh, delegate leader, chief delegate, he was, you know, he became the um, secretary of the um, UN General Assembly, you know, that sort of, um, so, and what Prince Juan also had this position. So there's a lot of politics of the UN going on. And that's sort of like transposed to Bandung. And Bandung has different priorities than the UN, obviously. But what they do is they do bring in the United Nations politics and way international diplomacy is conducted within the UN forum into Bandung, because all these countries want to be legitimate. They want to be seen to be sort of like proper states, you know. And um, because Bandung uh, initially had very bad press from the United States and uh, Western countries, where they saw this as a kind of a parley of um, you know, uh, former colonials, uh, former colonized uh, peoples. And so in that sense, um, they wanted to show to the Western world that uh, they, they were kind of, you know, proper sovereign states who knew how to conduct these um, international governings. And they would do so according to the United, what's acceptable within the United Nations Charter and its, um, and its framework. Great. You know, a couple of questions from my colleague in history, Scott DeBose, one that's directly picking up on this and then, then another he posted earlier. Let me um, ask them both to you. But do, do you think that the decision, the invitation of Japan to Bandung is a 
causal part of the path towards Japan then being brought into the UN or that was already in the cards anyway uh, because it was it was as, as Shigata points out I, I believe it was Shigemitsu who was um, the uh, the key figure in bringing a key figure in bringing Japan into the UN uh, and also Shigata asks about the 1943 conference the emotion in the speeches as opposed to the lack of emotion in the photographs can you say something about and this relates to the earlier question about language perhaps but that Bose, that Bamao, that Laurel um, as Shugata has read the record, I haven't read the record, um, but I'll trust him on this, that there was plenty of emotion in those speeches. And is there something different about what the, the work of the photos and the work of the speeches uh, that were delivered? Hmm. Yeah, um, thank you, um, Professor Bowles, for that very interesting, insightful question. Because in fact, um, if you read um, the newspapers, it does say, particularly Bamao and Bose, like Bose cried in, uh, in gratitude to, um, uh, for being given Nicoma, uh, Nicoba and Andaman Islands, you know, that sort of thing. And Bamao was ecstatic about. So you read, you read these things in newspapers, but you can't really see them in official photographs. Now, What's really interesting to me about uh, the distinctions between the two is that 1943 was very much about official photographs um, of the conference delegates of this, this and that. Now in Bandung, there was not a single official photograph of the entire uh, delegation. And that's really quite notable, I think, because one of the top things that we all do in any conference is actually to take photos <laughs> with the um, people gathered, but they didn't do this in Bandung. Now, in Band for, but, but the interesting thing about um, the sources from Bandung is that um, you will find a lot more visual sources than textual sources. Um, and, and so this is why may, I- May think I just speak for a minute just to uh, yeah. clarify what I said because when I look at the visual records of 1943, I find very intimate photographs of, let's say, Shubhash Chandra Bose with Shibusawa Shakuro's family in their homes, even with children. Uh, mm. Now, I'm not sure whether they were published or not, uh, but also uh, looking back at the past, uh, you know, visiting the UNO Art Museum and so forth, talking about the artistic connections between Japan and India going back to the early uh, 20th century. So quite apart from just those very well-known formal photographs that you showed, uh, there are many, many other photographs in very intimate settings and very often the other Asian leaders by themselves, not mm. just with uh, the, the Japanese uh, mm. uh, officials. Uh, mm. And also I think that Bandung had a very strong statist quality as well. Uh, you know, the freedom struggles that were still being waged not so far away uh, were not being given a, uh, a seat at, at, at the table. So I think we need to be careful about not drawing too sharp a contrast uh, between mm. those two uh, you know, uh, conferences of the kind that you, you are yeah. drawing. And if you look at the formal resolutions, they sound very similar, <laughs> the five mm. uh, formal resolutions that were, that were passed. I mean, this is not to, uh, un, uh, you know, uh, not to say that Japan did not have its own uh, motives during the war with its uh, military reverses and so on in uh, convening the conference. But there are other visual sources uh, which are quite prominent, which need to be taken into consideration in both cases. Mm. Okay, so um, thank you for that. I actually haven't seen um, Shibasa's um, and Bose's photographs. So um, if they're if they're available readily, I would love to see them. I've seen um, uh, Prince Juan Tayakon because he had um, his, I think his son was studying in Japan. Uh, and there were some photographs uh, in newspapers in the lead up to the conference uh, that introduced some of these leaders and sort of humanized them, you know, sort of give personal human stories about them. And um, so there was a bit of building up going on 
to uh, in the lead up to the uh, 5th and the 6th of November. But I, I'm afraid I just haven't seen enough uh, of the 1943 sources. So, um, I mean, this is, <laughs> as you probably figured out, it's, it's actually, um, uh, it's, it's, it's just hasn't been my main project at all, but I just wanted to apply this kind of method to a Japanese case study to see how it worked. Um, so there's a lot of scope for me uh, to do more research and particularly I'm very intrigued by what you said about the uh, informal photographs surrounding the conference because uh, you know they, they will I'm sure they're bound to tell me uh, you know different stories about this um, interpretation of this thing. Well, thank you. Th thank you so much, Shigata, for that, and and Naoko uh, Shimazu, Professor Shimazu, for answering uh, so many questions. Clearly, this is this has been a great talk that's um, brought up a lot of issues. I think I, we were able to um, raise a little more than half, maybe two thirds, but certainly not all of the the very interesting questions that. Um, were posed. And I, I think that um, Shin can share with you the file of the chat so that you can see the others uh, as well. But uh, we've reached the end of our time, so we're going to have to wrap up here. I want to thank uh, you in the audience. There at, at the peak, I think there were about 90 people with us, which is terrific, and uh, from all around the world. And uh, Thank you, Professor Shimasu, especially for a really uh, provocative and fascinating talk. So with that, we'll close today's proceedings, but thank you all so much.